things just a little bit differently here today because I've lined up some really special people to talk to about the biggest issues of the day, the three big things that we're going to be talking about. And before we get to the U.S. Senate debate and all of that sort of thing, something big happened uh, yesterday. And, uh, you know, we're in this sort of ADD climate in our country where, where we go from one story to the next and we jump from thing to thing. And what we try to do here at Georgia's Morning News is talk about the things that are important to you as well as, you know, not forget about the stories that are happening every day. And Bo Bergdahl, of course, was a story, or the release of Bo Bergdahl was a story uh, a few months ago, and a lot of people think it's gone off the radar. Well, what was happening behind the scenes was an investigation into uh, what was happening and this prisoner swap that happened. Uh, and it really came to uh, a head in many ways uh, when um, we had this horrible and horrific murder of uh, James Foley this week, uh, and we find out there was negotiations trying to get him out also. Joining me right now is Lee Ellis, a dear friend of mine that uh, I have known for years. He's a Georgia guy in in every way. He uh, served in um, the United States Air Force and uh, was a prisoner of war for a number of years in Vietnam in the Hanoi Hilton. And we have talked to Lee over a number of times over the years about leadership, about his time in Vietnam, about what has happened. Uh, but we're going to talk to him a little bit today about this new GAO report that came out saying that the we broke the law in making this swap for Bo Bergdahl for these five, what's called now as the Taliban Five. Lee, thank you for getting up so early in the morning with me. Hey, good morning, Martha. Well, I'm usually up about this time, so not a problem. <laughs> good to be with you. I appreciate it. You know, tell us what you thought. Um, first of all, about the Bo Bergdahl swap, and then what you thought about the GAO report that came out yesterday. You know, Martha, I always look at try to look at things from what is the person in the street? What would a, a normal, rational person, how would they see things? Well, a normal, rational person would look at swapping five criminals, uh, one of whom helped plan the uh, 9-11 attack for one uh, GI as a little bit out of proportion, and so, that, first of all, it didn't seem like a reasonable thing to do to me. Secondly, um, the situation with Bergdahl was such that we, I believe we could have worked through that a little bit longer. I'm certainly glad to have him home, but there were a lot of issues there, and I think we could have worked through that a little bit more carefully. And then, of course, the third thing was the issue of uh, just making, making the decision to do this without bringing Congress in. I think was just a big, big mistake because the law required that the president involve the Congress, and uh, he pretty, pretty clear he ignored that. And I don't know why he did that. You know, I just, I guess he, he just assumed he had more power than he thought than he really did, or he, he obviously knew that he couldn't do this because he signed the bill that required him to give thirty days notice to Congress. So it's just really kind of a, almost a brush off. Well, and Lee, the the GAO, which is not a partisan organization, they're just the people that look into these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, use terminology like clear and unambiguous, you know, that right. this, you know, and then the Department of Defense comes out and says, well, the Justice Department said we were fine, so we're okay. Well, that may be true. Uh, and it seems to be a lot of that going on when people just assume that um, if I want to do it, it's okay. I call that drinking too much of your own Kool-Aid. When you just say, well, I want to do it, so it's okay. And you see this sometimes in leaders. I see this in business leaders sometimes. And that's how we, uh, that's how we step over the line sometimes in our character is when we just assume that if I want to do it, it's probably okay. Now, this particular situation really, I think, highlights kind of what's happening you know, across the board, and you alluded to it a little bit, that there is a, a bit of a, you know, they used to call George Bush a cowboy, you know, that just wanted to do what he wanted to do, but this administration seems to just say, okay, this is what we're going to do, you know, we're going we're gonna to shoot first and ask questions later, and we're not going to worry about it. That does seem to be prevalent, uh, and maybe that's the way some people operate, but it's not the way of law and order in our country, and that bothers me a lot. You know, another one is the release of information on this raid when they went in and tried to get Foley. 
uh, that to me just made no sense whatsoever. And so much of the action to expose Navy SEALs and Special Forces and Black Operations, Special Operations people, to uh, in order to get uh, good PR, uh, they spread just spread out too much information about what goes on there. We, the goal of those people is to not be known, not to be known. Do you, um, in, in getting forward to what happened to James Foley this week, I mean, the only comfort I've been able to find out of this is in my reading about him. He was a very faithful person. He expressed his faith not only publicly, but it appears that his family was extremely faithful. I don't quite know of, you know, a situation where I've heard of where when something like this happened, the Pope actually called the family. They were a Catholic family, and uh-huh. um, which was just got to be for them, you know, some sort of comfort. I I did find some comfort in the fact that he appeared to be, from previous writings, a very faithful person that believed in, in, in his salvation. And so that you know, even as horrific as this is, you get a, a little bit of comfort out of that. You know, I hadn't read that part, but just from what I did see and hear about him, he seemed to be a person of real courage. And when you said faithful, I took it in several ways, but faithful to what he believed and faithful to, uh, you know, his his profession, his country, uh, faithfulness to good principles of living. Uh, and to his commitment. So to me, he was uh, someone to be admired. I think, uh, you know, I'd sure like to learn more about him. Yeah, I was. I did a little bit of research, and we actually put it up on Z Politics. And and he went to Marquette University, and he had done a number of articles for Marquette as an alum, and and uh, just very personal, faithful articles about what he believed. And you know, and that's getting harder. I mean, it shouldn't be harder to do. But sometimes it is, and um, I'm always encouraged when I see people doing that. Now, we're going to take a quick break here on Georgia's Morning News with Zoller and Bryant. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Colonel Lielis uh, about uh, what to do next, because our foreign policy is in a mess, leadership is not being shown, and we need to restore leadership in this country. That's kind of Colonel Ellis' uh, uh, wheelhouse, so we'll talk more with him next right here on Georgia's Morning News. And uh, we're talking with Colonel Lee Ellis uh, right now. And Colonel Ellis, of course, is a retired uh, United States Air Force colonel. Uh, He was a POW uh, in the Hanoi Hilton during the Vietnam War. Uh, He also has the best-selling award-winning book, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. And more importantly, he's from right down the road where we're broadcasting. And he is a Georgia guy uh, in every way. And uh, Colonel Ellis, we're in a... A difficult time where we have, uh, you know, in the entire Middle East, um, really, uh, that I can think of in flames, probably problems in Northern Africa. Um, We've got this caliphate called the Islamic State. I mean, even our uh, leaders are calling it the Islamic State. Uh, And uh, you've got these folks, either ISIS or ISIL, whatever they're calling them this week, that are going through and, I mean, just beating up and and killing and pillaging and being barbarians. I mean, that is really too nice a word for what they are doing. They have a lot of our equipment because we left it behind as if it was the dead of the night. You know, the only thing that was missing when we left Iraq was the helicopter on the top of the building trying to get them out. So we've got a difficult situation in the Middle East right now, and we have a president that with all due respect, seems more excited about whether we have a minimum wage or not increase than he does about keeping our country safe. You know, Martha, the world is a very dangerous place right now. I guess it always has been, but it seems more so now. And I think that requires uh, courageous leadership. In fact, uh, to have good leadership, it always requires courage, and that's one of the central themes of my message as I travel. I do a lot of keynote speaking and writing of blogs and articles, and I really try to focus more and more on character, courage, and competence. If you have those three, then you have uh, a good foundation for leadership. And I think the courage part is where you have to do difficult things. You have to make hard decisions. And every human being faces those every day, but when you're the higher up you go, the bigger those decisions get and the more courage it takes. To think about being President of the United States, 
the leader of the free world, or at least the potential to be the leader of the free world, and you have to make decisions that uh, uh, affect all these things that are going on in the Middle East. Well, it just takes a lot of courage, and here's the problem, is that the longer you put off making a tough decision, usually the options get worse and worse and worse. So you end up, even in the best situation, you're usually taking the best of the worst situ- of the best of the worst decisions and as the th- as time goes by the decisions and the options get less uh, attractive and less attractive so you have to make harder and harder decisions so we're kind of in a box i think in the world today because we don't have a clear philosophy about who we are in the world and are we going to be the leader and if not, are we willing to let somebody else be the leader? And who is the? Are they going to be good guys or bad guys? Well, there's not too many good guys out there that are stepping out to lead, but a number of bad guys are. So that's kind of the world we're facing right now. You know, I had an opportunity when I ran for Congress a couple of years ago to have lunch with Condoleezza Rice, and um, the thing that stuck out from that meeting was, you know, and I'm sure she's not the first person that has said this, but it's the first time I had heard it that when. Um, America does not lead, it creates a vacuum, Uh and it usually gets filled with something that we don't like and we're going to have to respond to at some point down the road. I think that is so true. Well, I think that's true in any situation. Uh, You know, leadership abhors a vacuum. Somebody's going to step in, and quite often it's the bad guys out there that are going to try to step into that vacuum. And that's where... Our will is so important, and going back to um, having a, you know, a foreign policy. I think anything you do that is a major long-term consequences, you need a philosophy behind it, principles underneath that, and then some sort of a model that you can follow as you make decisions. And that's how you go about making decisions. Uh, I do that personally in my life. I'm working on a new book right now on accountability, and the first thing I'm going to do is lay out a philosophy of why do we need accountability. And why is it a good thing? And then I'll build and show the model of uh, what it looks like visually, and then I'll go and take those pieces and break them down into kind of a how-to, which would be some of the principles underneath that. I think that applies in foreign policy and especially in all areas of leadership. And right now I feel like we don't have a clear philosophy about our foreign affairs. We don't have a clear model to follow And I think that's not serving us well. Let me ask you a question, because there's been a lot of talk about whether the president should take a vacation, shouldn't take a vacation. Look, I I don't begrudge the president, any president, taking a vacation. I think that the president goes, you know, the president's never off, even if he might be in somewhere different. However, I think that... You know, George W. Bush, once we went to war, once he had troops committed, he stopped doing a lot of the recreational things, the public recreational things like playing golf, things like that. I mean, he still exercised, but he he was a little more um, subdued about it. And, and it, you know, you seek this job. person that becomes president of the United States doesn't just wake up one morning and find themselves president of the United States. They run for it. They raise a lot of money for it. They ask for it. They know that it's either going to be four years or eight years. My view is, if if you know you've asked for this job, you know it's the hardest job in the world, and I think that it probably is, then go to Camp David or go back to the place you live if you need to get away. But it's a four-year and eight-year commitment. Make some sacrifices. I think that uh, that makes sense. I think it does seem like, uh, I, I agree with you, first of all. I think it is a hard job, and I think the president does need vacations. Uh, I think uh, he's probably had more vacations this year than most of us have. And uh, But in the case where we have national security at risk, and we have things going on in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, that are fairly serious, it, seem, it would seem like, We would feel better if our president was in the driver's seat and uh, more than on the golf course. I think it would just give us, uh, it would show leadership that things are serious, uh, we're addressing them, we're dealing with them, Uh, ISIS, uh, you know, we're dealing with ISIS, we're dealing with all the different issues in the world. We at least would have the feeling that 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 was the case. He may be doing it anyway, but we would have more of a feeling that was what was happening. Well, I tell you, I... I am probably more scared now 
because leading up to 9-11, a lot of us didn't know that what was coming. I mean, you looking back on it, there was chatter. There was, um, you know, things that led to it and, and things that maybe were signals. But we didn't know. And, uh, and this bothers me a lot because these people, this ISIS group, ISIL, whatever you call them, uh, Lee, that's evil. That is evil, and that's the only thing you can call it. You're exactly right. Uh, it is evil, and that's what we're really fighting. You know, I, I, l- I love the fact that Ronald Reagan called it what it was. He called it evil. I think it would be good to do that today, too. Absolutely. Lee Ellis, thank you so much for being with us today. You can go to leeellis.us and get more information. And, of course, his most recent book is Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Thanks, Lee, for being with me today. Martha, good being with you again. All the best. Thank you.